This morning we're going to look at God's truth as it's found in a landlord, the occupation of a landlord. Last week I met with a group of pastors slash friends, peers of mine. We, we meet once a month just to go over what we do. And after that meeting, one of the pastors came up to me, a friend, and said, uh, John, I read your post on preaching God's truth, my blog post on preaching God's truth in a landlord, and I got to tell you, I just don't get it. What about all the slum landlords out there? And my very gentle and moderated response to this friend was, what about all the televangelists out there who are fornicating and preaching a false gospel and manipulating people all around the world? How dare you get up and preach this Sunday? i got to work on my grace <laughs> and tone a little bit. But he kind of nodded and backed away slowly. The job of a landlord, like all jobs, can be done right or it can be done wrong. And like most things, including you and your work, it's a mix of both. And this morning, we're going to focus on not so much the slum landlord side of things. We'll acknowledge that truth and that reality, of course, but more on what's right when a landlord gets it right and seeing what that rightness can say about the rightness of the heart of God, the author of all right things. As I mentioned last week, the primary landlord text that I'm going to be using this morning is a man named Sam Colias. And Sam is the CEO of Boardwalk Equities, and they hold the rents or have 35,000 units under their management. So this guy is the CEO of the company that is the biggest landlord in Canada. May as well go big if you're going to go exegete a landlord text. When I first sat down to interview Sam, I kind of wanted to lay out the theological groundwork for why I would, was meeting with him. And I said this, I said, Sam, I believe the world belongs to God, and in that way, if God's the owner of the whole place, we're all kind of tenants. And I believe that when you're a landlord in the right way, you can image the God who made you, being a co-landlord with Him. Sam is a person of faith, so I could use that kind of language without freaking him out too much. And I said, Sam, I believe that in the just right landlord moments that you create through how you are a landlord and run this company, I think those moments can be iconic and we can look through them or past them or before them or after them and see God. We say it every Sunday in this church that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, implicitly or explicitly. God said to Job, who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. And we are, in a way, tenants. We are making our lives on a planet within a universe, a cosmos, that God has made. He created this and all things for us to be here. This is His vineyard that we're tending and making a life in. Everything that is, is His. And in particular, for this morning's theme, including your home, your apartment, the place where you live, belongs to God. In the Old Testament, God made a landlord-like landlord promise to King David. He said, and I will provide, provide a place for my people Israel and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. And God committed that particular promise in the scope or, or within the context of a larger promise or arrangement that he was making with David, a promise that he was reaffirming through David. In theological terms, a promise that came in the context of what the Bible calls a covenant, which is an arrangement which, if you were to look at it, stand back from it, looks a lot like a legal arrangement that a landlord might have with a tenant. 
Throughout the Bible, God reveals himself as a covenant God. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And I will promise this to you, and you need to promise this back to me, like a promissory note. And you need to write this down. All the covenants were written down. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jeremiah. And you need to keep this agreement and keep it safe somewhere and bring it out once in a while and reread it so that we're all aware of what the covenant arrangement is. Oh, and have it witnessed by several reputable witnesses and outline everybody's responsibilities and obligations on both sides and make sure their fiduciary responsibilities are clear and make sure everybody knows the blessings of keeping this deal, this promissory arrangement, and the curses of breaking this covenant. (laughs) When I read it in the theological journal, I go, oh my goodness, like I used to do leases in real estate. This sounds like a lease. It has all of the components of it right there. And like many leases, the covenant arrangement was between two parties who weren't equal really at all, not at all, because one party was God And the other party was them, us, human beings. God held all of the cards. He was the landowner. He had all the power, and the people had little. And yet, God was so gracious and serving and humble with all of that power entering into that covenant in his dealings with us. In 2009, and this is when the idea of preaching a landlord first came to my mind, I read in the Globe and Mail report on business an interview with Sam Colias, and in that interview, Sam is quoted as saying this, I was raised in an an environment where you help your neighbor and treat them like you want to be treated. That's our number one rule as a company. It's in our policy manual, and we ask everybody on our team to always think of the other person like they want to be thought of themselves. Yeah, you can't read that in the report on business at 7.30 one morning and not have Jesus' words come to mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. That's the first commandment. The second is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, Jesus said. And in Jesus' view, everybody was your neighbor. And everybody, in the context of a landlord who has 35,000 family tenants, are those, those, are those, those tenants are the neighbor to that person. And in Jesus' worldview, especially everyone included the loser, the lost person, the the freak, the one on the outside, the low-income type tenant. When I asked Sam about the best part of being a landlord, he said, it feels best when we are providing for the least fortunate. And I won't go on about how that company, because of his values and their values, does that, but they do that in spades. As I saw this executive of this big Canadian landlord expressing his heart towards the poorest of poor and finding the most meaning in his business when he sees the covenant lease play out in that context. I thought, I think this feels best because in those times, perhaps he is closer to God than many of us who aren't landlords might be, but maybe as close as some of us who do have power over a lot of people and choose to engage them as our neighbors might know. But there's something about having all the power and then extending such a grace to a neighbor who is weaker than you 
that to me exemplifies and brings out the power of what it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself. God cuts you such a good deal, and God, perfect, holy, the owner of everything, extends such a grace to you. Disproportionate love, a great home, a life. He even calls you as children. God loves this way. So I thought, maybe a landlord who has to care for so many and has provided a home for so many could say something unique, or through him we could see, I could see, we could see something unique about your heart, God. So, where did that happen in engaging this CEO of Boardwalk Equities? One of the biggest things I saw through Sam Colias was God's joy and his delight in providing us with a home. Just a couple of quotes from a meeting we had, which I recorded, so he said these things to me in the course of that 40-minute discussion. First thing, as soon as I get in the door, I love people, John. He hugged me on the way out. He loves people. Uh, I think he does. And then he said this about what he does. It's more than just the physical house that we're providing. It's the home, a place where everyone feels a sense of belonging. This sense of belonging, this feeling part of the community, is more important than the brick and mortar. That's the joy in our job. And as he's saying this, he's coming out of his chair across his desk toward me. He's so excited about the joy of providing community and belonging and home to other people. I wonder how much God comes out of his chair at the joy of giving us these things. One of Sam's greatest joys was when tenants come to him, often in times of grave emergency, and he says they come to, before they call 911, they call the people, our people in the building. In many cases, they'll call us before they call the ambulance if someone's having a heart attack. We have our customers' lives entrusted to us. How much more of an important job can you have than to have somebody who can afford the rent and and is not impoverished? I kept pushing him beyond just the goodness of his work serving the poor. There's a goodness in your work, Sam, in serving everybody who's your tenant, no matter whether they're impoverished or not. So he says, who can afford the rent and is not impoverished, come to you in the biggest time of need like a health emergency and say, help, help us. And here we're phoning 911 and getting service. It's a huge honor and such a joyful feeling to have that. It's so joyful to be able to provide such an important service called a home and a community. At that point, he's totally standing up behind his desk, and I'm kind of leaning forward out of mind because of what he's saying and the goodness of that, but also because, man, this will (laughs) preach. Surely this is the heart of God beating in this man for those people in an imperfect way. And Sam would be the first to acknowledge that, but surely in a God-honoring way as well. Have you ever considered the delight that God feels in providing a life and a home and a place and belonging and love to you? We should all cram into Sam's office this week and I'll show you what the joy of God kind of looks like in the face and the passion and the heart of this image bearer. The love that motivates his provision. I'd give anything for you. His strong desire for you to know that you belong, you have a place, you can feel secure and protected, and you know you have a home how he longs for you, especially in times of emergency where you've got nowhere else to go to come to him first. And how deeply, deeply, deeply he delights in saving you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. 
I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt. I will gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return, and they will come back with weeping, and they will pray as I bring them back, and I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path in a good home where they will not stumble, because I am Israel's father. Ephraim is my firstborn son, and I will give them comfort and joy, and your children will return to their own land. The whole story in the Old Testament was about the people getting a land and God having a land for you, a place for you, space to make life. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. The Lord will create a new thing on earth. So God's heart must be beating in a big way in the heart of this landlord CEO. And Sam, like I said, knows that. Every time I would try to draw attention to God's truth in him, he would duck. (laughs) He wouldn't let me pin it on him because he's a guy like me and maybe like the rest of you. You're not all guys if you're girls, but you struggle with your ego. You struggle with your faith and drawing attention to yourself, and so he would duck all the time when I would cite these God truths and what he does. And he knew, and you could tell he knew, that it was all by grace. And the timing was by God's grace, as it is for all of us. One point in the conversation, and we had earlier talked about where landlords stand on the trust of society pecking order, that we're some, they're somewhere between used car salesmen and telemarketers. And I said, well, no, I think pastors are in that place. And but we figured we were both beside each other in terms of the level of trust extended to our roles in society. But regarding the grace side, he said, if, there, if God's there for a wretched soul landlord like me, he's absolutely there for everybody else. And the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God prepared in in advance for us to do. When a landlord is doing what a landlord is meant to do, They are doing the good works which God has prepared in advance for them to do. What gets me excited is if that's what you do, imagine knowing God in the moment of caring for that family, of showing patience and grace when other landlords may not, of not jacking the rents up to the ceiling because the market can bear it, but instead being fair and equitable and then being blessed in return when those tenants stick with you for the long term. Imagine knowing God in the goodness of living in God's goodness and being his image bearer in those ways. And then you doing it in your business, and you doing it in your business, and then you when you're, and all of us, in all of our vocations, in all of those locations, all of those places that God has called us to the good gift of work, knowing him. How are you any less a landlord and a life giver to those who are employed and work for you at the office? Or when you teach them, your co-caregivers and life holders and love givers with Christ. Now, it doesn't always work out like that. 
and I know it doesn't always work out like that for Sam either. And there are slum landlords, and our world is filled with not so gracious providers of homes. And there's bad tenants, too. A week after meeting with Sam, he pops me off this email, I think in frustration, saying, after hearing about a resident member that carelessly left a cigarette burning and started a fire where two others were hurt with minor injuries today, it's easy to feel angry when things like this happen. This is just one example of carelessness, disregard for others, physical, verbal abuse, etc., that can easily evoke in a landlord negative feelings. I responded wondering how God must feel when, when we do this. Another landlord, I don't know where he's from, he posted online, I think from Ontario or the States, wrote this post on my blog. His name's Larry Luth. We have been, we have been landlords for a few years and have been burnt by a number of tenants. When we started this enterprise, my wife and I told each other that we would not rent out a space we would not want our own children living in, and that has been the level of care we've given to our properties. On two separate occasions, we had issues with our tenants that caused us to consider how to best deal with them in a Christian way, so obviously a guy of faith. When we purchased our first property, there was a single mother with her young child living in one unit. Mostly, she was a good tenant, paying on time, etc., and then without warning, she left, leaving the apartment full of junk and us out of a few months' rent. The next tenant in the same space was a wonderful person and a tenant and tenant until she lost her job, had some surgery, and stopped paying her rent. We gave her the benefit of the doubt and believed her excuses and promises to pay us back, and in, in the end, we had to evict her. If you feel the pangs, right, of wanting to love. This came with pain for us as we hoped she would come through. How God must hope we come through. We've learned a lot in the process and are much more picky now with how we pick tenants. All that said, I am glad God does not treat us as we deserve, but graciously allows us to stay on even when our rent is overdue and we trash his place. He quoted Psalm 103, and Larry's right. God does not treat you as your sins deserve or repay you according to your iniquities. No, God comes to you in your iniquity while you are still trashing the place not paying attention, not living the life in the home that he's given you that you could live, and extends grace after grace after grace and offers a home to the homeless and says, in my Father's house there are many rooms. And even though when he came to us to proclaim the truth about who owns the world, and who his father is, we killed him, killed the messenger, abused him, took advantage of him when he was calling us to task to our covenant obligations. He still loved us. And in the dying moment says, Father, forgive them, those tenants of ours, those people. They don't know what they're doing. And then through that moment, God turns all of our brokenness within the covenant relationship around and resurrects it and makes it new and gives us a foretaste of an eternal newness and home that we'll one day know. I'll create a new thing on earth, God said through the prophet Jeremiah. I am making everything new right now, he says, through Jesus Christ enthroned. And the prophet, it was foretold that God will write a different agreement, not the fiduciary kind of close to a lease kind of Old Testament thing, 
that went for so many centuries, but this new agreement will be different. It will be written in a different place, indelibly within you. I'll write it on your heart. A place that no landlord can touch in the way God does through Christ. From the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Let's pray. We, uh, I, we always think, you know, the, the bad tenant, the one with the problem, is the one who's overtly trashing the joint, who's uh, running away from their obligations, who's uh, acting in overtly sinful and broken ways. And your example when you walked this earth, Jesus, was that while that is true, It is also so very true in those of us who think we're good and righteous and keeping the laws and keeping up our obligations and deserving of the blessing to the point of boasting. Equally broken, equally in need of grace in the eyes of God. The difference between the rottenest of tenants and the best of tenants is negligible, imperceptible when put against the difference between humanity and sin and a perfect and holy God. So as the owner and landlord and keeper of all things, we pray, humble us. And then renew us and lift us up and give us hope and give us a life. If God can save a dirty, rotten scoundrel of a landlord or a tax collector or a prostitute or you or you or you or me, he can save all of us by grace through faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for how you show your face through, uh, through how a, a landlord can and does um, operate out of our city and the beautiful parable that that is. Every time we enter our home, help us to remember these truths and to be thankful and to respond accordingly, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God in my living, there in my breathing, God in my waking, God in my sleeping, God in my resting, there in my working, God in my thinking, 
God in my speaking be my everything 